today in Food Bites. We're visiting the Agriplex and the Western Fair to see the work of the growing chefs. Hope you enjoyed this one. Hello, I'm Alana Gustlitz. I'm the garden program coordinator here at Growing Chefs Ontario. Today we are in our Agriplex garden that's here at the Western Fair District. Um, and I'm talking to Luis a little bit about myself, my journey in agriculture, as well about all the amazing things I get to do working at Growing Chefs and different ways we're bringing food education to everybody. So a bit about myself, um, I'm originally here from London, Ontario, um, but I went to university in Halifax. I actually studied Middle Eastern politics and then I took a little break um, and when I finished university and I did some volunteering abroad on some farms and I really, really liked it. I worked with Slow Foods, which is an international organization in the Caribbean and got to establish school gardens. Um, and it was amazing and I loved it. So I came back to Canada and did a farming apprenticeship under Michael Abelman at Foxglove Farm on Salt Spring Island in BC. And that was a great learning opportunity. I got to be involved in every aspect of the farm and I especially loved doing the farmer's markets and working with the chickens. I did not like doing the irrigation so much and some of the other jobs but it was really great to learn every aspect of farming and then I got the amazing opportunity after that to work for an organization that Michael Abelman who was my mentor co-founded in um, Vancouver called Soul Food Street Farms which is just an amazing project and something I would love to see come to London um, which uh, is a social enterprise that produces beautiful organically grown food in underutilized vacant spaces in the downtown east side of Vancouver um, and is an organization that employs folks who are living right there in the downtown east side. So I was the distribution coordinator. I got to work with all the fancy restaurants and get them to support our cause and support our amazing staff by buying produce and running our farmers markets as well and that was another great learning opportunity in the world of urban agriculture. So working at Soul Food Street Farms definitely shaped a lot about how I feel about growing food, food as a human right, about employment, access to green space, urban agriculture. It really changed a lot of the way that I see the world. And one of the most important aspects of the organization is the employment of folks from the downtown east side with no strings attached. So sobriety was not required, housing was not required, they didn't need a permanent address. A lot of the barriers that exist, even in organizations doing the best they can here in London, they often have a lot of barriers to employment or even barriers to volunteering. Um, and so working at Soul Foods, I really saw the struggles that come with that model and also the amazing rewards. For example, there are staff that have been working there for over 10 years now who have secured permanent housing and their lives have been completely transformed and they're now managers of specific farm sites. So I really do believe in that model and it created a beautiful place to work that also had a lot of its own struggles as well. Um, growing in an urban environment, there's always gonna be a lot more theft, a lot more vandalism, um, but because our community knew our mission um, and we had lots of signage explaining that and our staff were really protective of the farm, that was not our major issue. The biggest issue was working in a downtown environment. You've got pavement, so you're in a really extreme heat sink. The hot, 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 um, Vancouver summers are even hotter when you're working right on pavement and we were growing in big pl recycled plastic containers so those are also getting really hot so irrigation the amount of water we were using was really um, important to be on top of because things dry out really quickly in that kind of environment but the benefit of it was it was completely portable so the containers were specifically de designed and print um, and uh, manufactured by a recycles plastic company for Soul Foods so that they could be forklifted. So there's forklift inserts right in the bottom of the containers and those came really in handy in my second year working there when we had to move an entire half acre farm beside the stadium across False Creek. So we moved an entire functioning farm to a new site 
and again by using underutilized vacant spaces those don't exist forever in an urban setting developers buy them they want them for parking there's different multi-uses for these spaces so being mobile was really really helpful to the operation and it allowed us to get leases in places yeah. that didn't want to commit to more than a few years so again that's a model that i think in London, we've got a lot of really underutilized urban space and it might be planned or slated for development, but it sits for five to ten years. Or we've got a lot of brown sites where it's paved, like an old gas station, for example, or old dump sites where the soil is contaminated. But if you're growing in a separated container, in a raised bed, a container with fresh organic soil brought in, you can be using those underutilized vacant spaces. And that's an example of something that we're doing here at the Western Fair, where some of the soil um, might be contaminated from past uses. Um, we're able to grow in raised beds totally separate from that contaminated soil. So how big are these containers? Are like this four by four, I guess? Yeah, so the containers are about a meter by a meter, which is what and my metric conversions are great it's about three and a half feet by it's about four by four so um, they're pretty small but they're um, run in rows so it really feels like a farm there's irrigation lines and sprinkler systems going down the rows the rows were the standard kind of size that you would see at a at an organic market farm we're growing we were growing in blocks so you'd have you know a salad block you would have a fruiting crop block um, we also used those same ship uh, um, those same plastic containers to grow inside of the greenhouses as well. So there was large um, unheated greenhouses utilizing those containers. So they were really multi-use and they lasted a really, really long time. In comparison, the original site of Soul Foods was built um, just out of old uh, lumber beside the Astoria Hotel and that had to re be rebuilt constantly and eventually it got replaced with the plastic growing containers. So after working in Vancouver for Soul Foods for two years, I really missed my family close by here in Ontario. So I moved a bit closer to Toronto and I worked for a year as the youth program coordinator for uh, Green Thumbs Growing Kids, which is a great organization that works out of Regent Park, Cabbage Town, East End area of Toronto um, that has school gardens, established school gardens that they facilitate programming in um, and do school workshops and so I worked with the teenagers and we were able to employ a few of them over the summer we did farmers markets it was really really fun and that's a really great vibrant neighborhood um, of Toronto with some schools that really really could use the food supports and really could use that that aspect of outdoor education because a lot of folks in that area have never visited a farm before have never seen how a tomato grows just because it's right there in the urban center so that was a great um, place to be working so after working for a year in Toronto for Green Thumbs Growing Kids, I wanted to move back to London, be closer to my family here because I was about to start a family of my own. And I looked around and saw who's doing urban agriculture, who's doing education with kids. And I saw that there was a chapter of Growing Chefs right here in London, which was amazing because the original chapter of Growing Chefs, the only other one, started in Vancouver in BC. And so I already was familiar with the organization because um, Growing Chefs in BC would bring children um, from schools on tours of the farm at Soul Foods. So Growing Chefs in BC is really volunteer run. Um, lots of chefs volunteer and farmers to give education to kids through school programs all about growing and cooking delicious food. So um, it's a funny coincidence that there was a chapter in Vancouver where I used to work and a chapter here in London where I was moving back to. Um, so Andrew Fleet, who's the executive director and co-founder of the Growing Chefs here in London, um, he actually worked in fine dining in Vancouver for years. We probably overlapped a little bit and we didn't even know it. And he was a volunteer chef for Growing Chefs in Vancouver and he loved it there. He's also originally from London. So when he moved back with his wife to start his family here, um, they co-founded a chapter of Growing Chefs right here in London. 
So Andrew and his wife moved back to London here and started a chapter of Growing Chefs just through volunteer work. They've worked out of many locations, many trunks of their cars. Um, Andrew volunteered a lot of his time. And one of our original volunteers as well, Catherine, um, is now Chef Catherine, the head um, executive chef here at Growing Chefs. So she was the first um, employee after Andrew um, to join the team. And from there, it's really grown. We have a staff of over 15 um, full-time employees now and we are in two locations we've got our headquarters at King and Maitland in the old Auberge de Petit Prince building and we for three years now have been here at the Western Fair in the new Grove Agricultural Hub. Um, it's an agri-food hub where there's lots of businesses. Growing Shafts was one of the first ones to move in there um, over the pandemic and we've got a huge beautiful dedicated teaching space as well as a commercial kitchen where we're able to run our school lunch programs and we've got all these beautiful garden spaces we have access to thanks to the amazing team at the Western Fair and Dan Lismore's landscaping team. So a little bit about Growing Chefs before I get a bit uh, dive deep into our gardens. Growing Chefs is a not-for-profit. Um, we are a charity um, that teaches kids, families, the whole community all about growing and cooking healthy food from scratch, supporting local as much as we can and growing as much as we can. Um, so I run the garden programs with the help of a garden program assistant and together we maintain these beautiful garden spaces, we do children's programming and we do a lot of community work. So the garden is a really great place for therapeutic work, for smaller groups, for folks who are still not comfortable working back indoors. It was really great over the pandemic to have so much garden space because a lot of our volunteers come from vulnerable sectors and they were able to come back and volunteer and have that interaction after being so isolated um, in the safety of the, the beautiful outdoors. Um, we're also able to provide volunteer opportunities to different folks who often face barriers to accessing meaningful volunteer work, be it due to mental health issues, addiction, um, differing abilities. So we're really, really lucky to be able to offer so much garden programming now with our expanded gardens. Um, our culinary programs are amazing. They're so much fun and they're very popular. Um, so our school programs, we do both in-school programs where our chefs and educators go to schools. We work with every single class. We visit them two times and we do amazing curriculum-based lessons all around preparing food right there in the classroom room and all around our food systems so we really always bring home the lessons of our local and our global food systems the impacts that our choices make and the impacts that us as a community can have on our local and global food systems so as well as our in-school programs, we do field trips right here to our education kitchen at the Grove where classes come and they get hands-on right in our teaching kitchen and help prepare a meal from start to finish. They get to come out to the gardens and learn about how food grows, harvest fresh ingredients, bring them back to the kitchen, prepare a beautiful meal with the help of our education chefs and then sit down and enjoy it together and even learn about waste. We are so lucky here at the Grove at the Western Fair to have a worm farm beneath our feet run by Dan Lismore's amazing landscaping team here at the Western Fair. So all of our food waste, even our weeds from our garden, all of our food waste from our kitchens goes to feeding those worms. And in return, we get beautiful organic compost um, that we add to our gardens. And you'll see it really helps our gardens grow beautifully. So we get to illustrate right to kids and community groups that visit us this full circle food system that we are a part of it's hyper local and it's nothing can ever be zero waste but it's as little waste as possible and we see the benefits of it as well so we really love showing that this can be a viable economy that can really expand um, so we're so lucky to have all of these resources here at the Western Fair and 
And it's really amazing to see because the Western Fair's original roots has always been agriculture. It started off as an agricultural fair. You know, who can grow the biggest pumpkin? Who's got the most beautiful heifer? Um, and over time, you know, the rides at the Western Fair have become very popular. There's now horse racing in the casino. They've really diversified their operations, but they're really bringing back that history and roots of the agricultural aspects with the Grove as an agri-food hub, as well as supporting amazing tenant projects like the Hutton House um, Grow Towers that are our neighbors in the Grove, as well as the Wormery Project and Growing Chef's Gardens. So it's really amazing to see them celebrate that history as an agricultural fair and really be going back to those roots while still having a really diverse offerings of enter entertainment opportunities. So I get to do so many amazing things in my role here as the garden program coordinator at Growing Chefs. I get to give tours of our gardens, I get to educate the community about growing food, but one of the things I'm the most passionate about is our food box program that we started as a pilot um, two years ago in collaboration with the Ontario Student Nutrition Program Southwest Region, where we provide bi-weekly fresh food harvested from right here in our gardens. Um, directly to families in need um, that are identified through school support workers. So on our end, it's completely anonymous. It really respects the din dignity and access that these families need. Most of them are newcomers and they might already be accessing the food bank or other emergency supports, but it's just not enough to get them by. So we are able to provide these fresh food boxes directly to them through school support workers who they already trust, who they already access, language supports, mental health supports through, and there's a lot more uptake of those other supports knowing that they're also getting these amazing food supports. And we do our best to grow as many culturally relevant crops as we can because most of these families are newcomers who are looking for fresh greens, certain herbs, certain fruiting crops that they want to be using in their recipes. These families have extremely high food literacy, so all they need is a little bit of help of access to those really fresh ingredients to make their cultural foods and for me it's very special because I studied Middle Eastern politics in university I'm very passionate about it and I get to grow these foods where I already know the names in Arabic for families who are coming here from places like Syria and Lebanon and Turkey and we're growing you know Turkish varieties of eggplant and mulukhia and Lebanese zatar and all these really fun things right here in our climate as well as harvesting things wild like sumac that are used both in this part of the world and that part of the world so it's just really beautiful bringing together two of my interests which is food security food sovereignty as well as history and politics so that is my favorite program and we've been really lucky with the help and support of so many sponsors and donors including the Western Fair and in-kind sponsorship through the food bank of our beautiful hoop house and um, so many other sponsors um, have allowed us to continue this program into a second year and the more we can grow the more families that are ready for our support so I'd really love to see our gardens expand and this program expand because it's really getting to the food to folks who really see it as very valuable and really relevant to their lives. So at Growing Chefs, we try to grow everything with the smallest footprint possible, um, doing the least damage to the environment as we can. So we grow everything with completely organic practices, um, and we utilize what's called integrated pest management. So whenever people have questions about the garden, their number one question is how to get rid of pests. And my answer to them is always, unfortunately, you can't. You can't always get rid of pests, but you can work together with the environment um, to do your best to still get a really great harvest. So one example of a pest we have here at Growing Chefs is a very hungry groundhog. And um, we've got things like kohlrabi growing right here and um, collard greens that the groundhog just loves to come take a little nibble of. What we try and do is we know where the groundhog lives. We try and grow things close to him that he likes to eat. For example, they love brassicas. They love these collard greens. 
and it lives just beyond this fence. So we kind of have sacrificial crops. I always recommend to people grow more than you need and grow some sacrificial crops because those pests are going to come, especially in an urban environment. Things like squirrels, birds, groundhogs, we've got them and we're not going to get rid of them, but we can work together to still get a lot of food for us and share a little bit with them. We're really lucky here too at the Western Fair. There's hawks that live on site. Oh. So that really helps us with a lot of the smaller rodents that you might get in an urban environment. Um, but we also get a lot of pest pressure, especially in the heat of the summer in our greenhouse and our hoop house from different bugs. So aphids, spider mites, thrips, we get lots of different um, pests, but we use, like I said, integrated pest management. Um, so we have a lot of tools in our tool belt that are all organic that we can help control the pests. That's awesome. Oh, stay right there, please. That's the $1 million shot. Look at that. So, I'm so, yeah. so we, like I said, use integrated pest management. So when we notice some aphid pressure right here on our beautiful sweet peppers, we do things like introducing um, predator insects like ladybugs, lacewings, praying mantises. We use a variety of kind of all around predators that target all sorts of different kinds of bugs. Um, and those ladybugs, mantises, they don't eat our plants, they eat the pests that are eating our plants. So things like aphids and spider mites, even mealybugs. Um, we also use what's called diatomaceous earth, which is just crushed crushed up seashells. It's this white powder here. It acts almost like a fiberglass and cuts up the bodies of soft shelled insects and does not damage the plants at all. And it also is completely food safe. So it can be rinsed right off of um, vegetables. You might be familiar with it if you've ever had a cockroach itch issue. Um, diatomaceous earth is used for that. It's also used as cattle feed to give them some calcium. So it's completely food safe and it's a great tool um, we use here. Oh, that one hatched. Like that. And then look at our oh, French at melons. And the <gasps> ladybugs are all hanging out underneath. It must be nice and wet in there. Oh, that's Yeah, we've awesome. got a couple over here too. Oh, come on, he's full So these are um, like the Chanteray French melons. Michael Abelman always grew these, and so I was like, I'm going to grow them this year. Growing chefs at the Grove. We've got some beautiful garden beds out here full of lots of edible flowers and herbs because sometimes we have culinary programs where they don't have time to go all the way to our gardens, but they're still able to come out here and have a sensory experience, smell different varieties of basil, pick edible flowers to garnish their plates with, and just learn about some different varieties of crops right here outside of our door. Hi, I'm Chef Matt. Uh, this is Growing Chefs at the Grove. I'm one of the lead education chefs here at Growing Chefs. Uh, my background is I graduated from Fanshawe College and I worked in the restaurant industry here in London for almost 15 years, uh, spending some time working in restaurants as well as teaching at Fanshawe College in the later years. Uh, I was lucky enough to get to do a little bit of traveling uh, to Nova Scotia and work at a restaurant out there. And then I found my home uh, about a year and a half ago here at Growing Chefs after volunteering and doing some events for some time. Uh, I became a full-time member of the team, and uh, I'm so honored and happy to work here uh, for this awesome organization uh, at our location here at the Grove. How is to work with kids and teaching about uh, real food, like the growing part? For sure, yeah. yeah. Um, we're really lucky. We get to uh, do kind of the best of both worlds, as far as I'm concerned, where um, not only do we get to use amazing uh, local food, but we get to teach all about it uh, and work with young minds, uh, which is fantastic because um, I'm a very curious person, but there's nothing like the curiosity of the kids that we get to work with. Uh, so it's really, really great. Uh, it's an awesome organization and uh, love getting to work with them. Right now, the Ontario Program of School is including uh, food education. What that means for you guys? That's right. It means a great deal for us because uh, we've been able to get in and, and we're doing a lot of education in the schools. And I feel like it's amazing to see uh, how we're kind of coming back to uh, our roots now, if you will, uh, where 
fresh local food is becoming much more important. And uh, I mean, it is the basis of everything. It is incredibly important uh, for so many things we could go on about. Uh, but it's really, really amazing to see that we're, we're getting back to that on an education level uh, across the board. Um, if you haven't checked it out, you can find out on the Thames Valley District School Board. We have some fun videos of math on the move. Um, you can reach out growingchefsontario.ca. We have our pizza nights. Uh, we do def different events, uh, private cooking classes, all kinds of different fun things coming up. So uh, please stay tuned. And if you haven't yet, sign up for our newsletter. Again, growingchefsontario.ca. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good one. <laughs> We say goodbye to Chef Matt, and we went to the trucks, just another quick drive away. We did want to show the first greenhouse that the growing chef were growing on. This one is inside of the truck. It's a heated one. It has a nice ventilation system, but sadly, our microphones and camera were running low of, of battery by that moment. So I hope you enjoyed this visit to the Growing Chefs and at the end of that day was a really big storm coming. You will see it at the end. Hope you enjoyed this one. Have a good one. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. Jeff from Chillin' and Grillin' with Jeff. We're back for season three. We've had the opportunity to see some great backyards and have some great barbecue. Join us, Chillin' and Grillin' with Jeff. Watching Rogers TV. I'm just finishing up my fifth year of volunteering here with Rogers TV. I've learned all aspects of how to put on a TV show, both in front of the camera and behind, and working with some great volunteers, learning how we do everything in front and behind the camera. To me, being a volunteer is helping giving back to the community and making sure that we put on a quality program for our viewers to watch and being out there and making sure it's done properly. Just get out and volunteer. You'll have a great time. You meet a lot of great people and you'll really enjoy it. And you'll, surprisingly enough, you'll get recognized out in the community for your volunteer work. There's not a day goes by or a week goes by that I don't find somebody says, hey, I recognize you from doing this show or that show. So get out and volunteer. You'll have a great time doing it. And we're always looking for great volunteers, so don't be afraid to get out and help. I am God Greg. My name means everything. Tom Longboats! I am Wolf Clan, out of Daga Nation. I've run many different races. I've run to survive and to be free. I've run to win. For honor. His people might be lazy, but this one's damn fast. My people respected our runners, people who carried important messages from village to village. I need a guide to the next post. Dispatch carrier, sir. I can get you there. God's sakes, man. Slow down. Where do you think I am? Tom Longboat? No, sir. 